Hi, thank you for coming. For your audience here. The program today is called the Pioneering Women of Early Rock and Roll. I'll have the handouts. You'll see the singers will be covering. I have a couple, a lot of them, but I'm sure some may have left out. When it comes to the early days of rock and roll, some of the most pioneering and powerfully influential figures were women. Birth rock and roll was also multiracial and diverse. These female pioneers of rock and roll faced various challenges, including sexual aggression, exploitation, and unfair pay. Post World War II ideal of femininity posed major challenges to women who sought to participate in rock and roll. Women who were in rock and roll, their careers didn't always resemble those of the more famous men. Some female performers were popular and performed uh, nationally as stars, while others were more influential regionally. They made the pop charts, but even more had an impact through live performances. Some of the women exhibited the kind of wild on stage behavior like Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard. This presentation will highlight the music these underrepresented women played to overcome the obstacles and make it in this business. These women defied the odds and changed the landscape of rock and roll. First one we'll talk about is Sister Rosetta Thaw. Some say that rock and roll was invented by a black lesbian, sometimes called the godmother of rock and roll. Sister Rosetta Thaw was the daughter of two cotton pickers who were also singers. She came out of a gospel background in Arkansas and began rocking early. Her music was rock meets gospel. She sang in churches and in nightclubs. It was also very rare for a woman to play the electric guitar on stage. Gospel and folk licks with jumped up swing rhythm that anticipated rock and roll. Chuck Berry said his career was one long Rosetta Tharp impersonation. <laughs> She toured and had a relationship with Marie Knight for years. In 1950, the duo and the partnership broke up, and a year later, Sister Rosetta Thaup married her manager in a baseball stadium concert wedding. 25,000 people attended. She was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2018 as an early influence. This woman was really looked over. People just didn't know who she was, and now she got some recognition when she got in the Hall of Fame, but she's still not really well known. Anyway, we're going to do a song called This Train, which is a traditional song that, that she did with a, uh, her gospel. Um, uh,
Ruth Brown was a rhythm and blues singer who was born in Virginia. When she was a teenager, her friends pulled their money and sent her to New York to a talent contest at the Apollo Theater. She came in first place. At the beginning of her career, she patented her sad and stage act after jazz singer Billie Holiday. But soon, she easily crossed over into rock and roll, and she recorded many hits. Her hits helped to establish Atlantic Records as a major label. In the late 60s and into the 70s, Ruth Brown's musical career faltered. She wasn't receiving royalties from her earlier records. She became a domestic, and she drove a school bus. She was the elderly. I did whatever was necessary to maintain a livelihood for myself and my two children, she said. I did it with dignity then, and I'm not ashamed of it now. Her musical career, however, kicked back into gear in the late 70s. She began a different kind of stage career when she was in a few Broadway productions. All this little girl's gone to rock.
Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sucker at um, the pub on um, Star Drive. I saw her late in her career and she was in a wheelchair, but she sang, she still had a nice voice. She sang well, but she was much older. And, uh, anyway, uh, Laverne Baker uh, was another rhythm and blues singer who crossed over to rock and roll. She began singing in clubs in Chicago. Grew up loving music. Bird Baker's aunt was the blues singer Memphis Minnie, who was big in the 20s and the 30s. She was a great influence on her. As a child, Laverne performed gospel music, but she was compelled by a strong desire to perform secular music in Chicago uh, music clubs. In 1955, she had a hit with Twiddly D, but it was copied and released by another record label, a woman named uh, Georgia Gibbs, used to copy all of Laverne Baker's records. <coughs> and the other, the other record company copied her arrangement and it hurt her sales, it killed her sales. Laverne Baker spearheaded a growing opposition movement against this copycat practice. She was one of the first of a growing list of artists to apply pressure on labels to discontinue the practice. After her peak years, Laverne took a job managing an offices club in the Philippines in the, in the US military. Years later, she made a comeback in a preempt on Broadway. Back when the, um, the other record companies were copying her music, she was on a tour and she had to take a flight, and at that time, you had to take out flight insurance. For her beneficiary, she put down Georgia Gibbs, and they asked her why, and they said, well, she, well, she said, uh, if she dies, Georgia Gibbs won't have a career. <laughs> Twiddly D. Hey, sing along with any songs that you might know want to sing along with. Love it if you sing along. Ah! 
The next thing we'll talk about is Etta James. She had a few very popular songs. Uh, I'd rather go blind and another one at last than you made her. Etta James was born James Etta Hawkins in Los Angeles. James's mother was still in high school when she was born. She was largely raised by an aunt and then by a foster family. Later in life, she learned that the, the pool hustle of Minnesota Fats was her father. Yeah, her mother ran around with a rough crowd. It was during the mid-50s when she adopted her trademark platinum blonde hair. She wanted an edgy look to match her sound. She said, I didn't want to look innocent. Anna had a lot of problems with her personal life. She struggled with addiction and committed check fraud. She served time in jail and spent 17 months living in a psychiatric hospital. In the 1980s, she had a career of renaissance. She opened for the Rolling Stones and sang at the opening ceremonies for the 1984 Olympics. She did a Chuck Berry concert film. Eddie James was a huge influence on countless rock and roll singers. Rather go blind. Counterparts, she was originally a country western artist who crossed over to rock and roll. She continued to perform throughout her life and retired at, uh, the, at the age of 80 a few years ago. The song was originally recorded by Elvis. It was later copied and used by Paul McCartney to write a song called In Spite of All the Danger. This was the first original song recorded by the Quarrymen, who were later called the Beatles. Paul McCartney was a big fan too. This one's called Trying to Get to You. I've been traveling over mountains, even through the valleys too. I've been traveling night and day. I 
been running all the way They've been trying to get to you was 16 when she started. Actually, she was much younger. She was 16 when she quit. Um, uh, uh, she got pregnant. She got married. She was a southern. And she got married and she got pregnant. The, uh, the record company you know, could hide the, uh, the marriage, but the pregnancy got difficult. So they kind of pushed her out. Uh, it was really too bad. But. Uh, Janice was sometimes called the female Elvis. Uh, she started playing guitar before the age of five. She quickly turned heads as a talented country musician and began performing alongside acts like the Carter family. After discovering a love of rhythm and blues, she made a debut record as a recording artist with the 1956 single Drugstore Rock and Roll, a song she'd written herself. Uh, following the single's breakout success, Janice toured with artists like Johnny Cash and frequently shocked the audiences with her seductive stage performance, which we'll be seeing here today with Jill. <laughs> Janice got married at 16 and she quit show business. Uh, she made a comeback in the 80s. And even when she made a comeback, she was popular in Europe, where they loved rockabilly and early rock and roll music. Um, she just not, uh, never got that popular here. She was on uh, RCA, the same label as Elvis, and um, they put out a record, um, Janice and Elvis, but um, Elvis's manager uh, pulled it. Uh, he didn't like it because it was, um, uh, he didn't like that Janice's name was first. He wanted an Elvis and Janice. So um, uh, the Colonel did a lot to, to stop her career. It's really too bad. Uh, he's, you know, he did some other things, but he really hurt some other people too, and I think he hurt Janice Martin's career. Anyway, this one's called Drugstore Rock and Roll. And this was before drugstores were CVS's and Walgreens, <laughs> where you could actually go and drink soda and dance. Rock, rock, jump, thump, rock and roll.
on the guitar. Thank you. When I go into the drugstore now, it's just to pick up a prescription. <laughs> it's my insurance. Very different. Things have changed. Another band that not many people know of, but who certainly had an impact on rock and roll, was the Ponytails. They used this name because there was an all-male group called the Crew Cuts. <laughs> Their rock ballad, Born Too Late, was a single which earned them national success. However, after their first hit, uh, the Ponytails didn't enjoy the same level of success with follow-up singles. Still, the Ohio Trio certainly were a source of inspiration for many females later on. This is Born Too Late. Francisco and best known for their work with record producer Phil Spector. Actually, this first record was the first uh, girl group song that Phil Spector did. He became known later on for working with the Ronettes and many other girl groups. The group consisted of the lead singer Priscilla Paris and her two older sisters, Albeth and Cheryl. Uh, their mother had tried to market them as a child act, and then as a teen act, and then as a showbiz act. She attempted to create three identical girls from three very different individual daughters. Uh, the sisters were not comfortable with this. Uh, they were made to dress alike, and they wore their hair the same way, just like the Andrew sisters. Uh, but all three sisters really resented this. I Love How You Love Me was originally intended for a male to sing, but uh, they gave it to the Paris sisters, and they made it a hit. And this was actually their only hit. In the early 60s, the Paris sisters sang a jingle, the Diet Right Soda. <laughs> Cheryl Paris later served as a production assistant on The Price is Right, and she worked as the host Bob Barker's personal assistant. This is called I Love How You Love Me. <clears throat> I love how your eyes look.
pretty sorry. The next thing I will talk about is Brenda Lee, oh, yeah. Yeah. who's well known. Brenda Lee grew up poor. As a child, she shared a bed with her brother and sister in a series of three room houses without running water. Brenda Lee's voice, her stage presence, uh, won her wide attention from the time she was five years old. At the age of six, she won a local singing contest sponsored by an elementary school. The reward was a live appearance on an Atlantic radio station uh, where she performed for the next year. At four foot nine inches tall, she received the nickname Little Miss Dynamite in 1957. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little taller than that. She's one of the first top pop music stars to have a major international following. In 1962, while touring in West Germany, she appeared at the famous Star Club in Hamburg, and the Beatles were her opening act. During the early 70s, Brenda reestablished herself as a country music artist and she appeared on the television show Hee Haw. Brenda performed rockabilly, pop, and country music. She's also known for her song, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, which has become a Christmas standard. This one's called Dynamite. You know this one? Dynamite? You know it? We'll see. One, two, three, four. by her father to appear regularly at talent contests. Uh, as a singer and as an accordion player, a television host uh, told her to change her name and to drop the accordion, advice she gladly followed as she began to hate the large, heavy instrument. Around the same time, Connie took a job as a singer on demonstration records for established singers. Uh, she finally got a recording contract after some failed singles, she was informed that her contract would not be renewed after her next single. Uh, that's when she recorded Who's Sorry Now? And it became a hit. She told the songwriters that she considered most ballads too intellectual and sophisticated for teenagers, and she requested a more lively song. When they played Stupid Cupid, Connie announced they just played her new hit. The success of Stupid Cupid 
restore the momentum of her recording career. This is stupid Cupid. Come on. Stupid Cupid, you're a real mean guy. Did, uh, her father thought it was a great idea to do a, a song of uh, a Jewish songs. Then she did German songs and Italian songs. So nobody knew what she was. She was actually Italian, but nobody knew. <laughs> and she did all these songs in all these different um, languages. And, and she, was, she was on Ed Sullivan a lot and uh, a lot of other shows. Anyway, moving on to Peggy Lee. Oh, yeah. No relation to Brenda Lee, by the way. From her beginning as a vocalist on local radio to singing with Benny Goodman uh, and his big band, Peggy Lee created a sophisticated persona, writing music for films, acting, and recording albums, combining poetry and music. Uh, she's called the queen of American pop music. And Brenda Lee recorded over 1,100 songs and composed over 270 songs. As the song Fever illustrated, Brenda Lee could take a rhythm and blues song and make it in her own style. Uh, what? Peggy. Peggy oh. said Brenda. Oh, did I say Brenda? <laughs> Peggy. <laughs> Peggy. Part of it, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, she could take a song and make it in her own style. She did this again with the Ray Charles hit Hallelujah and I Love Him So. It was controversial because of its gospel and blues music influences. But Peggy Lee gave it mainstream acceptability with a swing arrangement. She's been noted as a musical influence on many artists, including Paul McCartney. She's often cited as an inspiration for the margarita cocktail. In 1948, after a trip to Mexico, she and her husband requested a drink similar to the one that they had in Mexico. The bartender created the margarita and named it after the Spanish version of Peggy Lee's name. Uh, the Muppet Miss Piggy was also inspired by Peggy Lee. <laughs> Both of them were famous for being divas. And we have Jill here who is not a diva, let me say. I don't know what, what people are saying, but she's not a diva. 
Anyway, the song is Hallelujah, and I love her so. Beehive hairstyles, thick eye makeup, spiked heels, beaded gowns, pencil skirts, the chiffons, the crystals, the Dixie cups, the Ronettes, and the Shangalas, uh, and the Shirelles came across as assertive, insistent, self assured, and tough. We're going to do a song by the Shirelles. The Shirelles were a high school, they were high school friends from Passaic, New Jersey. They were unusual because they wrote a lot of their own songs. They made history for being the first all group to have a number one hit in the rock era with the song, Will You Love Me Tomorrow? The song we're going to do today is called Soldier Boy. It was originally titled, I'll Be True to You. The song's lyrics made no mention of a soldier. It was only while recording the song that the Shirelles gave the song much better lyrics and the title, Soldier Boy to reflect its narrative. The singer is professing love for a soldier boy. She promises to remain true to him while he's away.
The next girl group is the Supremes. The original members of the Supremes were all from a public housing project in Detroit. They formed a group called the Primettes as a sister act to the Primes, who went on to become the Temptations. For the most part, Florence Ballard, Diana Ross, and Mary Wilson performed equal leads on the songs. Um, before they had any hits, the group took on any work available at the studio, including providing hand clapping and backup singing for the Motown artists. Eventually, Diane Ross became Diana Ross, and she became the lead singer. Beginning with Baby Love, the Supremes would have more singles hitting the top slot than any other Motown act. The Supremes had a glamorous image. They appeared on stage in heavy makeup, high fashion gowns, and wigs, and performed graceful choreography. Soon the name of the act was officially changed briefly to the Supremes with Diana Ross, before they changed it to Diana Ross and the Supremes. <laughs> but uh, after a few years, Diana Ross left and she went solo. Uh, two months after Diana left the group, she played her first show at Monticello's in Framingham. Was anybody at the show? <laughs> anyway, the song is called Baby Love. You can help with the backup singing. <laughs> Jackie DeShannon. Jackie was one of the first female singer songwriters in the rock and roll uh, period. She's best known as the singer of What the World Needs Now is Love. She's also the writer of Put a Little Love in Your Heart. She wrote songs for Ricky Nelson, she dated Elvis, and she formed friendships with the Emily Brothers. Uh, her biggest break came in 1964 when she opened for the Beatles on their first US tour. She played in Boston in front of 16,000 people, and no one remembers seeing her, <laughs> including me. I was at the show. Uh, my father bought tickets. Uh, 
and I'm sure it was not the whole show because he paid three dollars and fifty cents a ticket. <laughs> and uh, but don't remember seeing her. Anyway, the song we're going to do is called "When You Walk Into the Room." It's a song that she wrote and sang. The song's lyrics detail how the singer feels when she sees the boy she loves. There's an expression of frustration by the singer that she cannot manage to tell the person of her love. female rock band signed to a major record label. Most female bands were ignored by the big record labels, and their live performances were seen as novelty acts. Goldie was a nickname given to the lead singer after her arrival in the United States from Poland. The Gingerbreads was a play on the drummer Ginger's name. Throughout the early 60s, Goldie and the Gingerbreads toured extensively throughout North America. This singer, Can't You Hear My Heartbeat, did well in England, but Herman's Hermits released the same song in the US just two weeks before the Gingerbreads version. This ruined their chances for a hit. They played together for a few more years, and soon Goldie went solo. Although they never had a hit record, they paved the way for women in rock and roll. This is Catch a Hymn Heartbeat, which you may recognize, may know, and feel free to sing along. There's one line you can sing, baby, baby, can't you hear my heartbeat? <laughs> Definitely, please sing along. And I can be part. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
Despite all the obstacles, female rock pioneers have made a lasting and influential contribution to rock and roll. They broke down barriers and stereotypes and inspired future generations of musicians. The struggles and triumphs of these women have played a vital role in expanding the representation of gender in rock music and have contributed to a more diverse and inclusive industry. We'd like to thank you very much for coming. We are the Richapolitan duo. This is Jill Goldman. This is Tucson. Thank you, we, have, uh, we also have a full group called Retropolitan, and we play 50s and 60s rock and roll. We play all around town, all around the towns around here. But uh, again, thank you very much for coming. I'd like to thank Kevin and the, uh, the center for having us. Thanks very much. Thank you.